Many thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this week's video. So a real quick thank you to everyone that entered the camera bag giveaway in the episode a couple of weeks ago. I believe there was over, I think, 1,500 entries, which was an absolutely incredible response. And I do have the winner selected that I'll announce in this week's episode, so be sure to stick around for that. Now, I do believe that one of the more difficult aspects of getting into landscape photography has to do with, I guess, wrapping your head around how to effectively edit the images that you capture while on location. And, and not to say that that mastering your, your camera settings or compositional techniques is just a, a piece of cake, but personally, I had a particularly, I guess, difficult time getting a firm grasp on post-processing when I first started. And so I've been told that some of my most helpful videos that I've created has to do with mistakes to avoid that are purely based off of the mistakes that I've made over the years. And in an effort to create as useful of content as humanly possible, I wanted to put together this video of beginner editing mistakes to avoid in landscape photography in hopes that, I guess, you can circumvent some of the issues that I've encountered over the years that'll ultimately and hopefully enable you to speed up your rate of improvement. So to jump right into it, and these are not rated in any specific order whatsoever, but the very first mistake is something that I call tunnel vision. And this is what it is. So this is an image from uh, the coast of Santa Barbara from a couple years ago. And what tunnel vision basically is, is if you envision yourself kind of, you drive into the tunnel, and as you're exiting the tunnel, you can see whatever the landscape is um, that's in front of you on the outside of the tunnel, but all the corners, all the edges of, the, uh, of your proverbial frame that you're looking through with your eyes are all darkened, and it's basically the overuse of a vignette. Now, I use a vignette on just about every single one of my photographs, whether I utilize it through the, uh, the effects panel by using the, the post-crop vignette tool, or sometimes I'll use a, a custom vignette or just darken down certain corners, but I absolutely love a vignette. But when I first started out, I just used it way too heavy-handed. And what's interesting about this is a lot of times you really can't tell, but if you look up here at the thumbnail and kind of turn off the vignette, and just look at the thumbnail up there. That's the, in my opinion, the best way to see if you are overusing or applying too strong of a vignette. And in this particular example, there definitely is too strong of a vignette. I am usually somewhere between negative five or negative 15 if I use the post crop vignette tool just to create just a real subtle darkening effect on the specific corners just to kind of draw the viewer's eye into the overall photograph. So tunnel view just using too heavy handed of a, a vignette is something that I used to do constantly in many of my photographs and still do a little bit too much uh, at times as well now. Now the, the next mistake is something that I call simple colors. And what simple colors are is, is really just not taking advantage of the, I guess, the, the multitude of different ways to enhance color inside of Lightroom. It's one of my favorite aspects of Lightroom is the ability to enhance color throughout your overall photograph. But when I first got started, I only enhanced color one specific way, and it was by coming up here to the basic panel and just selecting the saturation. And I would just pull the saturation up. The issue with saturation is that Saturation impacts every single color in your overall photograph the same exact way, where vibrance actually impacts the more muted colors a little bit more than the colors that Lightroom is deeming to be already more saturated than other colors. I know that sounds a little bit confusing, but here's a really good way to see the difference. If I take saturation and I bring it all the way down to negative 100, this image is completely black and white. There is absolutely no color in this photograph now. But if I do the same thing with vibrance, it looks like it's almost black and white, but you can still see color everywhere throughout this overall photograph. And I'll do that one more time. So this is negative 100 on the saturation, and then this is gonna be negative 100 on vibrance. And I think that's just a really good way to see the overall difference. So I very rarely ever use saturation. If I do, I just use it a tiny bit now. I usually utilize vibrance or some of the other many different ways or many different tools that you can apply. So I love coming down here into the HSL section and impacting very specific colors in the overall photograph. You know, you could bring the, uh, the green luminance value up a little bit, just kind of make those trees pop some. You could actually take the hue and bring it over a little bit to maybe make those greens look a little bit more like fall, or you could push them to the right to make it look a little bit more like spring. You can do the same thing with any of these colors throughout the overall photograph. And I just think that, 
utilizing the HSL panel or maybe coming down here to the calibration section where you can really make a lot of changes. There's just so many different ways to impact color in your overall photograph outside of just using the saturation slider. So simple colors is something that I used to do all the time by only utilizing the saturation slider and not really taking advantage of all the amazing tools that Lightroom has to offer. Now, the third mistake is something that I call global everything. And I talk about this fairly frequently on this channel is the, the overuse of utilizing global adjustments in your, your overall photograph and not really taking advantage of all the amazing localized tools that Lightroom has. So, you know, when I first got started, I really never used the radial filter. I never used a graduated filter. I used global adjustments for everything. So for this particular image, if I wanted to bring a little bit more detail into the clouds up here, I would bring down the highlights some. And that makes the, the, uh, the clouds or the sky look much better. But it also is going to bring down a lot of the highlights and the rocks right through here. And I don't want that because I want those rocks to really pop. Or maybe I want to add a little bit of clarity to those rocks to really make those stand out a little bit. But I don't like what that's doing to the clouds or doing up here in the, uh, the mountains in the background. And this is just a, an excellent use case for applying graduated filters or radio filters. So if I only wanted to impact the sky, I could hold down the shift key and just draw a nice gradient right across the sky right through there. And now I could bring down the highlights of only that region. I could hit the shortcut key O to see what I was doing. And if I don't want to impact those mountains, I could apply a really quick range mask to it and just mask out those mountains right through there. That way I'm only impacting the overall sky. And now if I toggle this on and off, you can see, let me make that adjustment a little bit stronger so it's easier. Now you can see that I'm only impacting the sky and I'm not impacting any other portion of the overall photograph. And if I wanted to apply the clarity only to those rocks in the foreground, I would grab a radial filter and just drag it right across the rock right through there. Hit the shortcut key O to see what I'm doing. And now I can apply the clarity just to that area right through there. If I zoom in a little bit, try that again here. <laughs> zoom in, maybe toggle that on and off to see what I'm doing. You can add, see this added just a little bit of pop bringing back some of those highlights as well because clarity also brings back a little or adds a little bit of additional luminance. But I would do that to all of the rocks in the foreground. So just using global adjustments for everything is a is one of the things that I think that really separates a, a good photo from a great photo. And it's something that seems to be a natural transition when you're kind of when you're first getting started with uh, editing photographs is just using those global adjustments for every aspect of your photo photograph. Now, the next mistake is something that I call cropless, and this is a big one. And it's basically not utilizing the crop tool near enough. And I think that this is a great example right here. This is a, an older image from uh, Moab from a couple of years ago, when this is the, the original crop that I had with it. But just everything up here from about this line up is just kind of, it's just gray sky. There's really no texture, there's really no detail. It's just kind of blank space. So by utilizing the crop tool and just kind of bringing it down a little bit to where the texture really begins right through there, that's the really the, the most interesting areas of that sky. So why keep areas of a sky in the photograph that isn't really providing any additional value to it? So utilizing the crop tool in this scenario, we can put the branch right here on this uh, side of the rule of thirds a little bit. What I love about these types of images is that the, the tree is definitely off center but the amount of space to the left and to the right of the tree is pretty much equal. And I really like those types of uh, scenarios like that. But I think that this type of a crop, I would probably remove this little area of bush right through here because I think that is a little bit of a distraction. But the crop tool is absolutely fantastic. It's in my opinion, it's a, it's a real game changer. Here's another good example right here. Just a real quick photo, handheld photo of this uh, little uh, a flower surrounded by these lily pads. A little bit of light was coming through, just hitting that flower. But all of this area up through here is just far, far too messy. Such a distraction, it adds no value to the overall photograph. But just by bringing this down just a touch creates a, a much more impactful, a much more powerful, a much more cleaner looking overall photograph than the original type of, uh, the original crop that I had in there. Now, the, the next mistake, and this is a really, really big one, and I think this impacts everybody when they're first getting started when post-processing their images, and it's something that I call crunchy. And it's just getting a little bit carried away with uh, adding structure to your overall photograph. Because in Lightroom, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Some of the most popular ways are by you know cranking up the clarity, 
cranking up the texture a little bit. And if you're not really familiar with what the difference between clarity and texture is, it, there's a big difference. Clarity basically is going to enhance the details of the larger um, objects in your, your overall photograph, not objects, larger details in your scene, where texture is going to enhance and add structure to these smaller details in your scene. So that's a, that's a big difference between the two. But you can really get carried away with both of these. And then, of course, if you want to go down into the, the detail section and really start cranking up your, your sharpening, you know, bring the radius up a bunch, bring up the detail. And sometimes it's really hard to see when you've gone overboard. But one of the easiest ways that I have found is, when, is to start to look for these halos. And if I toggle this entire edit on and off, you can really see the difference. If you look at the, the kind of the ridge line up through here, this is before and after before and after and you see how that halo is there now but before it wasn't so you definitely want to to back that off whenever you see those uh those halos starting to to um show up in your overall photograph that is the telltale classic sign that you have applied too much clarity or texture or too much sharpening to your overall photograph and you want to start to back those away until those halos are started to uh, to be removed from your overall photograph and then the, the last mistake, and this is something that uh, I think is a real game changer, and it's something that I call clipped light. And Lightroom has an amazing tool built inside of it that, that kind of, it's, it's like a warning system to let you know when you have areas of overexposed highlights, when you have areas of underexposed shadows. And what overexposed highlights are basically are is an area of pure white where there's no detail. And an area of underexposed shadow is basically an area of pure black with no detail at all. But if you come up here to the histogram and you see these little arrows up here at the top right in the top left hand corner, this one right here is your clipped highlights. And if I select that, you'll notice all these areas in red and let's make it even worse so it's easier to see. Let me crank up these highlights even more. So everything that's in red right through here, even down here in the waves, these are all areas of clipped highlights, basically pure white with no detail. So if, if you ever have those, you want to start to bring your highlights down or maybe even bring your exposure down a little bit until those clipped highlights are resolved because you don't want to have areas of overexposed, uh, really anything in your photograph. And the same thing with the shadows. So let's bring the, the shadows all the way down. Let's bring the exposure all the way down and select the, the actual uh, shadow clipping indicator right here. And you'll notice that blue indicates underexposed shadows. So this is areas of your photograph that have no detail in it whatsoever. It is pure black. And you don't want that either. So you'd want to bring those areas of shadow up until that area is resolved. Kind of bring the exposure up some. You can maybe even bring the black point up. There's multiple different ways to resolve that in your overall photograph. But by utilizing the, the highlight clipping indicator, the shadow clipping indicator in the top left and right hand corner of your histogram, those are real game changers. Those are things that are really going to help you to create that balanced exposure in your overall photograph. And I don't really know why Lightroom makes those little indicators so tiny in the top left and right hand corner because I've talked to so many people that are not aware of that and rightfully so. It's such a tiny little button in the left and right hand corner of your histogram. It's very, very simple to miss. So those are six of the the, the biggest mistakes that I made when I first got started, those are things that I wasn't aware of in the first couple of years that I was uh, editing uh, my landscape photos. And I'm hoping that if maybe you weren't aware of all of those, maybe that you uh, these will help you out moving forward as well. Now, before I do get to the, the camera bag giveaway winner, I do want to say a big thanks to the sponsor of this week's video, which is Squarespace, who I use for all of my website and my e-commerce needs. Squarespace provides a dynamic and attractive online platform to create your website. You can display your photography using Squarespace's professional portfolio designs and customize the layout and look and feel of your gallery just so you can make it your own. With Squarespace's traffic overview feature, you can track trends in page visits and views to better optimize your content. And you can even grow and engage with your customers with Squarespace's email campaign tools, which will enable you to create engaging emails that match your website with your products or blog post and logo, just so your messaging remains consistent. So if you're looking to start a new website or possibly upgrade your current website, check out squarespace.com forward slash Mark Denny for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. Now, as far as the camera bag giveaway goes, or camera bag giveaway winner goes, there was, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, over 1,500 entries, which was an incredible response for 
the mine shift uh, backlight 26 26 liter backlight I'm not sure exactly the, the 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 cadence of that name but this is the backlight 26 liter i believe from mine shift and uh i uh, it was a completely random drawing i just picked a random comment out of all of them and the winner is a gentleman by the name of Chandler Flynn. So Chandler, congratulations. You are the winner of the bag. I will be sure to ship this out to you ASAP. Just get in touch with me. Let me know where I should send it. A lot of times Instagram is probably the easiest way to get in touch with me. So send me a, a DM there and I will make sure that I get this out there to you uh, uh, as soon as you, you message me. So thanks again for everyone that did enter the giveaway. And I've got uh, plenty of other stuff to give away as well, which I will be doing I'm going to try and do a little bit, do, do these a little bit more frequently. So uh, just be sure to, um, you know, stay tuned for those. And I do appreciate you checking out this week's video. If you did enjoy it, if you could give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And as always, I really do appreciate you watching this week's video. And I will see you all next Wednesday. Bye.